coming up on Chasing the Natty. Week nine has arrived, and we'll be touching on some of those big time matchups and what we're looking for in those games. Followed by, of course, another round of your fan submitted start sit scenarios for the weekend. All this and more coming right after this. Caleb Williams dancing, cutting, mesmerizing run by the quarterback. Marvin Harrison, junior touchdown. Marvelous Mar. This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right. Welcome in, everyone. I am Justice. I am uh, your guest host once again, sitting in for Jared Palmgren, who's out this week. And I am joined by Justin. How are you doing, Justin? Hey, man. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good this week. It's another great weekend of college football. Glad to be sitting down and discussing with you again this week. Uh, so, yeah, another exciting weekend coming up in college football. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I mean, games are on right now. Uh, you know, I, I love this time of year when pretty much there's like there, there is a football game every every single day, right, whether NFL uh, or college. It's, yeah, that's uh, why October is my favorite month of the year. <laughs> It's pretty pretty awesome, and I, I love the uh, I love all the games during the week because it gives me I, I I get the opportunity to watch all those games. When Old Dominion has a home game, I miss I pretty much miss all the games on a Saturday. So um, I really relish the the, the week games because I get to watch them. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I wish more teams would, would schedule games like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. These sort of non-traditional times. Yeah. yeah, some of the day it's like it's great because you know you have all these games at once, but at the same time it's just hard to hard to watch them all. <laughs> yeah, especially when they schedule like you know there'll be like two big games that weekend, like two of the biggest, and they both at like twelve, but like, both at three. It's yep. like you couldn't have figured this out a little bit better, but it is what it is. Absolutely. Uh, we are part of the College Fantasy Football, or we are the College Fantasy Football Podcast on the Campus Canton Podcast Network. You can find us on all your podcast feeds and on YouTube every Monday and Wednesday morning during the season at 6 a.m. If you want to support the great work we are doing here, head on over to campustocanton.com. Subscribe there with one of our three tiers. You will find everything you need for your CFF, Devi, C2C, betting, and even college IDP. We have articles, rankings, projections, tools, and so much more. Um, you can also find us and the show on Twitter. Find Jared at CFF Jared and our CFF underscore Jared. And the show is at Chasing the Natty. You can find me at uh, Justice underscore 2318. I also uh, work to CF, CFF and college IDP work at Campus to Canton. In addition to hosting a G5 only college football podcast um, called the G5 Hive and a college IDP focused podcast, the Debbie IDP Grime. Uh, Justin, let the folks know where they can find you and your work. Sure. Yeah. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Volume Pigs. I'll be tagged most likely in this post. Uh, on my profile, you can see the link to my website, volumepigs.com. Uh, I do recommend subscribing directly because you know Twitter feeds can be sort of uh, unreliable. Uh, you might miss some things that I post. Uh, and then, yeah, you can find me occasionally writing on Campus to Canton as well uh, and on John Lobb's weekly waiver wire report. I believe you just published that earlier today. Tuesday I'm talking about. Uh, so, yeah, you can find me on Fantrax as well. So you, you can't escape me. Um, I'm everywhere in the CFF space. Yeah, as I said last week, man, you like your work's incredible. And and then, you know, you, you're a volume pig, right? I mean, okay. <laughs> I, embodying what I'm talking about. Exactly, yeah. exactly. You put out so much quality content. It, it's, it's pretty awesome. All right, well, we'll go ahead and uh, get started with uh, some matchups we're looking forward to this week. The first one that um, I had planned to talk about was a Thursday night matchup in the Sun Belt. Um, this could go a long way into deciding who wins the Sun Belt East, and that's uh, Georgia State against Georgia Southern. It also has a very high over-under at 62.5. Um, I'm looking forward to a Thursday night shootout. What do you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh 
cross-state rivalry. Uh, two, well, certainly Georgia State's a really good uh, team. You know, Georgia Southern, I guess, is they're pretty good. Uh, I, I have Davis Brand in one of my leagues, and I've been kind of unhappy with his sort of ups and downs. He throws so many yeah. interceptions. Like, I, <laughs> I didn't realize. Like, I was looking at the stats last year um, before I drafted him in this league, and I was like, oh, he turned it over a lot at Tulsa. Probably maybe he'll be better at Georgia Southern. But this guy, he just he has, like, reckless abandon when he's strong, I guess, and it, sometimes it works. A lot of times it doesn't. Uh, I like Georgia State to win this game. I think they're a more solid team. I uh, gotta gotta give a hat tip to anybody who has Marcus Carroll, especially if you drafted him in your league. Uh, he's been absolutely money. Like this year's sort of Caitlin Laybourne, I would say. Uh, he's been really consistent with his volume, really consistent with his production. Yeah. Uh, with players like that, though, you always worry as we go into the back half. Like, are they gonna break down a little bit? Because like he's literally he's been a volume pick since day one, uh, which is great. That's what you look for. But then you always do have to worry. Like with Laybourne, we saw it kind of broke down a little bit, sort of in November last year. So I'd look for that, but you know, you never know. I, I don't. I don't suspect that'll be the case. So should be a good game. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Davis Brin has kind of had two bad games in a row. Um, I, I look. I think this will be a bounce back game for him. I think. Uh, I do think Georgia State, like you said, is the more complete team. I think their defense is a little bit better. Yeah. Um, their running game's better. Um, so I do expect Georgia State to win. Um, the, the interesting thing is the line actually has Georgia Southern favored by a point and a half. So. Um, the game is it is at home for them, so that I guess that that kind of makes sense. They yeah, get that, they get that home bump. Um, yeah, a couple points. Yeah, but you know, I look for Darren Granger and uh, Marcus Carroll to have great games. Possibly Robert Lewis, and yeah. then you have uh, Burgess Hood and Brent on the other side. Um, if I any leagues I own those guys, I, I'm starting them all. Um, oh, one hundred percent. Something interesting too about the wide receivers is it seems like Hood has sort of ascended as the wide receiver one, at least in terms of targets. Like you look at his targets, absolutely. Yes. Burgess seems to be the guy who like scores more. You know, or at least he sort of has been. Uh, Hood actually is scoring a little bit more than he was, I guess, last year. This year, uh, like, I think even just in terms of points, like if you're in a PPR league, uh, Hood is clearly the wide receiver one of that team. Yeah, we um, you know, if you're in a zero PPR league, it might be a little closer. Uh, but I know, yeah, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, we you know, on, on the podcast I do on the G5 Hive, we we uh, talk about 2020 guys, mm -hmm. and, and so for receivers, that means top 20 in targets and top 20 in yards per game. And and Hood, Hood meets both of those criteria, whereas Burgess doesn't. Um, so He's yeah, not I agree with you. Like targets, I guess, right? Or is he? No, um, Burgess is in there for targets. Burgess is now. This is G five only. Uh, Burgess is twelfth in targets, but thirty second in yards. Whereas uh, Hood, is, Hood is fourth in targets and thirteenth in yards. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I suspected Hood had to be up there because, like, his target volume is insane. Uh, and, and it's actually he's always had good target volume. Just last year, it's like. His yards per catch were so low, he never scored touchdowns, and it was always Burgess scoring touchdowns. So now it seems to have balanced out a little bit more, and Hood has really, uh, really blossomed, I'd say, this season. All right. Uh, next game up is a uh, Big 12 showdown, Oklahoma and Kansas uh, at noon on Fox. The over-under, I believe it's the second highest over-under for the week at 66. Oklahoma is favored by nine and a half. Um, you know, Dylan Gabriel looks like a new wide receiver there, uh, one there with Nick Anderson, possibly. Um, the running back room is a little bit of a mess in Oklahoma. There's, you know, they they share and split the care. They have so much talent that, they, you know, they, they spread it around there. Yeah, sort of, you know, kiss of death from the CFF standpoint. You know, you just can't really ever confidently say before the game who's going to get the, the touch volume. So it's kind of, kind of a buyer beware running back room. Uh, yeah, you mentioned it. Oklahoma wide receivers. That's another one. That, like they, they have quite a few different players there. Even without Andrell Anthony, they've still got quite a few uh, wide receivers who see good target volume. Nick Anderson, you just mentioned. Uh, Jalil Farouk is there. Uh, I believe there's another. Oh, Drake Stoops. Yeah, Drake Stoops. When he's healthy, he sees a lot of targets. Also, something to I guess watch out for. I was just checking before the show. I think Jalen Daniels is dealing still with like some back issue. I'm not sure. He's going to be playing in this game, uh, so if you're yeah. sure, you might want to watch that closely. 
and yeah, besides those guys, I guess you know Devin Neal on the Kansas side. Uh, I get, you know, we're going to discuss him a little bit more later. I don't love that matchup. Oklahoma you know, has a pretty good defense now that Lincoln Riley has been banished or, or he's left the program for you know a season or so, and all of a sudden they can tackle again. So uh, yeah, anyways, but it should be a decent game. Hopefully, I guess. Yeah, Oklahoma has uh, two stud linebackers on their team. Like I said, they're a pretty stout defense. Um, but I just feel like, you know, if Kansas is going to have a shot, they got to feed Devin Neal, right? He's their best playmaker. Um, so, yeah. you know, I don't know. I, 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 unless I have, you know, way better matchups, uh, I'm probably starting Neal. Um, it just kind of depends on who else you have. But, yeah, we'll talk about – we'll talk about Neal a little bit more later. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, on to the highest uh, point total game of the week, and that's a G5 game in the American with Memphis taking on North Texas. The over-under of that game is 68. Uh, Memphis is favored by 7.5. Um, again, I, I, yeah, I don't think either team is a, is a – you know, they're okay on defense, but nothing spectacular. I expect it to be a shootout, uh, shootout there between Seth Hennigan and Chandler Rogers. Oh yeah, this should be a good CFF game. Uh, you got some good players involved on both sides. I'm looking for a big game from Rock Taylor this week. Kind of, uh, you know, had sort of an off game last weekend. He'd been pretty consistent for like three or four weeks in a row. So I'm looking for him to bounce back here. Um, yeah, on the North Texas side, I think it's the usual suspects. You know, Chandler Rogers has been pretty good. Uh, their wide receiver Macklin, he's been pretty. Despite Sorry, the fact that yep. targets are not elite, he still produces, you know, pretty well. So it's kind of an anomaly from that standpoint. But you know, he's consistently producing. It is, it is what it is. Yeah, it seems uh, like he's getting 100 yards and a touchdown every week. Yeah, so it's like, well, you know, he doesn't see double-digit targets all the time, but you know, he's extremely efficient, and they obviously scheme up the ball for him. So um, why not? Uh, also, yeah, shout out to the Memphis running back. Like Watson or new transfers, I'm sure you're yeah. familiar with him, Justice. Uh, he's been really good, you know. And he's another one. I don't think he's he's like consistent, like high carry volume, but he does get a lot of pass usage in addition to carry volume. Yeah. And yeah, he's had, he's had like a real sort of renaissance, I guess. And it's not that he was really like he was pretty good at ODU. Um, he's sort of just ascended even more at Memphis. And yeah. He's a guy that people don't really talk about that much, but like he's actually like in terms of just fantasy points per game. That he's been doing week in week out, like he's pretty good. Yeah, and, and you know he, he uh, two weeks ago, or I guess probably three weeks ago now, maybe where he was limited and they didn't say anything, and he only had like five touches. Um, but then you know this past week, it was good to see him be um, you know back to a full workload, so to speak. Um, he does rank tenth in touches uh, based on you know total touches for running backs in the G5 and he mm-hmm. ranks seventh in total yards. So, you know, that, that's a pretty productive running back. Yeah. I just pulled up his thoughts. I was looking at his touches. Like, yeah, he actually does see actually. So I stand corrected. He does see pretty consistent touch volume except for that one game. That just right. It, it's not always rushes, but like you said, it, it's, you know, it's passing, it's, it's receptions and attempts. Yeah. Yeah. So especially if you're in a PPR league, I mean, yeah, that's, that's almost even better. All right, uh, this next game, I misspoke earlier. This next game is actually the second highest uh, over-under, and that is USC against California uh, with an over-under of 67.5, USC favored by 11. Um, Yeah, I mean, USC's defense is terrible. So, uh, you know, California should be able to score. Um, This should be a bounce-back game for USC, right? I mean, they've had a rough couple weeks. and quite frankly, this could this, in my opinion, looking at their schedule, this could be their last win of the year. Um, they got a pretty rough schedule coming up. USC does, so um, hopefully they'll have a bounce back game and a positive uh, game for Caleb Williams. Yeah, yeah. No, I know their schedule down the stretch is pretty difficult. They play Oregon, they play Washington, they play I guess UCLA. UCLA uh, annual rival every year. Yeah. Uh, Caleb Williams, I have him in one of my leagues that, that like actually traded for him like late September. He was good for like the first two games, and then now like this past couple of games has been absolutely horrendous. Uh, and while I was happy to see Utah beat USC last weekend, just because I, I felt like they were overrated, 
Uh, I am a little bit disturbed by the notion that Caleb might be, you know, uh, hang, you know, calling it quits basically. Uh, so I, I want to see, you know, hopefully he's playing this weekend and he hasn't just like, you know, <laughs> see uh, a preparing for the NFL draft. Uh, my team would very much benefit from him still playing. So I, I hope he's, you know, he's playing and he, you know, continues to play for them down the stretch here. Uh, so yeah, uh, in terms of like USC as a whole, I mean, it's a good matchup versus Cal. Uh, you know, you're looking for a bounce back game. Cal should be able to score. USC's defense is bad, so it's actually a pretty good recipe from a CFF standpoint. USC's wide receivers are kind of a committee, so it's hard to really pinpoint one that you would want to start. Even the running backs, you know, they have two, Austin Jones and, and Marshall. Yeah. Marshall so it's kind of difficult outside of Caleb to really like uh, zero in on, on who you'd want to play. And then on the Cal side, you know, you obviously have Jaden Ott, who, despite many of his critics this offseason, and I was one of those, uh, he's been pretty, he's been decent, he's been solid. Uh, he was really good earlier in the year. Um, I think he's tapered off a little bit, but he's still pretty solid. So, yeah, uh, this game, I probably won't be watching it, but if you have players involved in it, it should be a good game from a CFF standpoint. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, like you said, what happens with the Caleb Williams situation. Um, so they only have four games left because they have they have the bye uh, in, in the championship week. So it is Kyle. Then they have Oregon, Washington, and UCLA. Um, I don't see. I don't see how they're going to be Oregon and Washington. Um, I guess UCLA is possible, uh, but it'd be interesting to see what happens with the Caleb Williams situation. Uh, Malachi Nelson's already played in one game, mm -hmm. so he could only play three more games before he would lose. So he he could play three of the next uh, four. Um, without losing a year of eligibility. So it'd be interesting to see if Caleb Williams doesn't play kind of what they do there. Yeah. Um, you know, Mil Miller Moss has been the backup all year. Um, so maybe they give him – if Caleb isn't going to play, I'm, I'm going to assume maybe they give uh, Miller Moss two games and Nelson two games, something like that to kind of – Yeah, just to see what they have. See Perhaps, what they got yeah. for next year. Um, uh, I would expect that Miller Moss would be the guy that they would well, – just because, like, as you said, like he's been the backup. Um, obviously, you, you, you want to see what you have with Malachi Nelson, but you also don't want to risk uh, Moss transferring out in this offseason when you don't really know what you have between the two of them. So yeah, probably exactly. not kind of happy if, if, if Williams isn't playing. Again, fingers crossed that Williams just keeps playing. I, I find this trend you know, so lame, you know, just that the fact that like you might just quit on the team midway through. I understand it, but, man, it's, uh, it's a tough look for the quarterback. You know, He's going to go to a team in the NFL that has a lot of losses, right? So it's like, you know, Having a couple losses and then just going and quits, it's not a good look. But uh, yeah, ho hopefully he keeps playing. Yeah, well, and the, I don't know if you heard the rumors too that um, some folks are, are were speculating that Jalen Daniels, the Kansas quarterback, is being courted by USC, and that's why and that's why he's hurt because he doesn't want to. He wants to save a year a year of eligibility, um, so he doesn't want to play the four games. Um, interesting. I, I guess because Lincoln Lincoln must have seen him. I guess when he was at Oklahoma, was Jalen Daniels yeah. even good at that point? Like, in, I guess twenty twenty one was the last year Lincoln was there. Uh, he would have been there. Um, he might have started towards the end of that year. I guess right. Maybe and maybe that's when Oklahoma played them and they just made a note of him. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it seems a bit random of all the quarterbacks. Like you know, Lincoln his track record at that position is quite you know well known and, and quite good. You would assume maybe he could probably punch up a little higher. I mean, I guess it depends on who's 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 looking around, I suppose. Yeah, you know, and that would also cause for me, if I was a Malachi Nelson owner, that caused me a little bit of concern. Oh um, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. If you're bringing in Daniels, uh, then he must not uh, he must not think Malachi Nelson is the uh, the future of the team there. Yeah, because he'll play freshman, right? Like that's literally what happened with Caleb Williams uh, yeah. when Rattler was basically you know, he wasn't playing well, and then they just brought in Williams. In 2021, that was his freshman season, I believe. Uh, and then he kind of started some of those games. They went back and forth, right? So, All right. Uh, our next game staying in the Pac-12 is Colorado uh, at UCLA, over under of 63 and a half. And UCLA is favored by 17 points. Um, that UCLA defense is pretty good. We got a change at quarterback with Ethan Garbers starting. Um I, I'm kind of interested to, uh, you know, to watch this game and see how how, how Garbers does uh, for UCLA. Yeah, likewise. I mean, with Chip Kelly, you never really know. I mean, he might just randomly decide to 
throw in the young kid again and see whether he like it's hard to get a beat on him if garbers is playing and I, I mentioned in my weekly waiver wire report that i published this week uh that sort of garbers would be an intriguing option this weekend just because I mean, he's the starting quarterback on the team playing against Colorado's defense. That's basically all you need, really, for CFF yep. uh, success. So it's assuming he continues to just be the starter and plays, yeah, I mean, he should have a good game. Uh, but knowing Chip Kelly, he might try to do some weird stuff. So you, you never know. You have to account for that. Call On the Colorado side, uh, you know, you have those three three wide receivers, Travis Hunter, Weaver, Jimmy Horn. Uh you know, there, there was that hybrid tight end, Michael Harrison, but it seems like as soon as Hunter came back. Yeah, he uh, kind of fell off. One, like, it's, it was kind of. Well, and Antonio's kind of kind of stepped up, too. Yeah, that's true. They, they do have, like, some of these other guys who just sort of randomly, like Omarion Miller, right, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Like, he all of a sudden just sort of ascended. He hasn't been heard from since. So, I mean, yeah, on the Colorado side, like, they're a great CFF system. They just, they pass the ball so much. Uh, there is a lot of just I don't know concentrated volume between basically three wide receivers. So, yeah, looking for a big game. Uh, take your pick of any of those wide receivers. I assume Hunter going to see a lot of targets. Weaver, Horn, you know, that, as it's been happening all season. So, look for Carson Steele to have another big week, right? Uh, I, guess oh, that, yeah. I guess that Colorado defense. Oh my God, yeah, yeah. That that would be the one thing I guess that would worry me in terms of Garbers is like this Chip Kelly just decide to just like keep it on the ground and just control the game and just run Colorado into the ground, which, you know, doesn't sound like a bad strategy. So if you do that, you know, Steele would probably be the weapon of choice. I, you know, you could be looking at a 30 carry game for him. So, uh, you know, if you're a shareholder of Steele's, you might want to you know, start him this week. Absolutely. All right. The, uh, the last game I have is a Mountain West showdown between UNLV and Fresno State, uh, over under a 58 and a half. Uh, Fresno is favored by nine when I posted this yesterday, and that might have changed now because I've heard some rumblings that maybe Mikey Keene is not going to be ready, yeah, I heard that. Right? which seems kind of surprising, right? Um, because he's had two weeks, but yeah. Uh, I mean- yeah, we're, we're, like I don't know the nature of his injury. I haven't followed that that closely. I did see that update that like he might not be playing this weekend. Uh, I mean, obviously, starting quarterback being out is a sort of a major sort of change or major fluctuation in terms of the you know who's 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 going to be favored in this game. You know, you know, V's been like sneaky good. I would say this season, maybe not not so sneaky anymore. I believe they're like six and one. Their only losses to Michigan. Uh, we all know Michigan's, you know, cheating. So they, <laughs> that, that we can chalk that that loss up to, uh, you know, st- signs being stolen. Uh, of course, that's the only reason UNLV would lose to Michigan. Uh, but other than that, they're like six and one, I believe, maybe five and one. Somebody out there. Knows. Yeah, they're they're six and one, three and zero oh in the conference, and Fresno is six and one, two and one in conference. Yeah, so this this is a heavyweight matchup. Uh, Fresno we expect it to be pretty good this year. UNLV surprise team, uh, you know, hat tip to that new coaching staff over there. They're obviously they're doing a good job. Um, and on the UNLV side, you know, Ricky White, he's kind of up and down. Uh, he has these random games where, you know, double digit targets, hundred yards, score. You know, he's kind of he is up and down. He's hard to be. He's hard to like rely on. If you had to like start him in the league, you probably well, you don't want to do that. But if you have him in best ball, you know, he's, he does provide some value. Uh, on the yeah, Fresno. De Jesus had a big uh, week yeah. last week. Yeah, he did too. Finally, right? That people right. have been waiting on him. He's, you know, he's been okay, but nothing really like worth being on the roster, really. And then last week he had sort of his first, I'd say, good game of the season. So yeah, look out for that to see if that sort of continues. They do move at a decent pace on offense. On Fresno State side, speaking of wide receivers, I mean they've they've got it seems like they've got like four or five different wide receivers who have at one point been. CFF relevant this season, right? Eric Brooks, really good at early in the year. Basically in October, he's fallen off. Uh, some of the other guys. Oh, Jalen Cam- Moss is the one that's kind of stepped up. Who? Jalen Moss. He's the one oh, that's yeah, kind, of, yeah. he's kind of, I feel like he's taken over the wide receiver one from Brooks. He might have, and he's a young kid too, right? Like, isn't yeah. he a veteran freshman or something like that? Yep. So they also have, I guess, this journeyman, Jalen Gill, Originally, I believe he's a five-star. He committed to Ohio State. Long he went time to Ohio ago. State and then yeah, Boston College. 
Yeah, and the transfer bag. He really has been having a renaissance season, and he's been solid. Like, he's been pretty consistent throughout the season. What I like about him is, like, he gets good targets, but they also, like, give him carries, which tells me, like, they he's just in the game plan. They're just trying to find ways to get him the ball, which is always a good sign um, yeah. in terms of, like, looking for volume picks. So this should be a great game. I might watch this one. I, I hope it's competitive. Um, I hope Keane plays because, that, that, you know, you want to see both these teams at full potential. Uh, but yeah, this, this should be a good one and should sort of t- give us some clarity on who might end up winning that conference this year. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Malik Sherrod, see if he can kind of pick up where he left off last game, uh, where he had a, you know, he had that huge game, um, hoping to, uh, ho- hoping he can repeat that performance this week. And then, you know, something interesting last week, you know, Doug Brumfield, who was the quarterback for UNLV early in the season and then got injured, he played two snaps at wide receiver last week. Um, and so I don't know if they're just trying to figure out a way to get him on the field. Um, so that's just kind of something I wanted to, you know, pay attention to, to see if they're going to, you know, if they're, if they're trying to transition him uh, mm-hmm. to be a wide receiver, just as a way of getting him on the field as one of their better athletes. Yeah. No, good call. All right. Uh, so now we will move on to our next segment and that is our start sits for week number nine. And as always, we will start with the quarterbacks. Our first question comes from Michael Erickson on Twitter. And his question is Haynes King, uh, the Georgia Tech quarterback versus North Carolina or Ethan Garbers for UCLA against uh, Colorado. Um, We've talked a little bit about the Colorado game, right? It's a prime matchup. Um, You know, Georgia Tech's going to also have to score, you know, to keep to keep pace with North Carolina. Uh, Haynes King is, you know, I think to mo- most everyone's surprise, has had a pretty productive and solid year so far, fantasy wise. Yeah, Haynes King is really, uh, I feel like I've used this word way too much on the show. He's had a renaissance season. Uh, there's quite a few players we've talked about that have had kind of bounce back seasons. Uh, Haynes King, not much was expected from him this year, uh, but he's been really good, actually. Like, uh, I think he's rostered probably in most leagues by now. Uh, in terms of comparing these two, you know, Garbers, he's, you know, he just had his basically first start last weekend. Uh, and it was a good, good performance. Nothing, nothing crazy. Good matchup though. Uh, and then King, you know, he's kind of been there all season. Matchup isn't as good though. So it does make this question sort of interesting. It certainly does. All right. So let's get to our picks. And we both agreed. Uh, we both went with Haynes King. Um, from my perspective, I just I just felt like the safer pick. Um, as we talked earlier about the Colorado game, you know, number one, you know, he he could decide to hey, in the second half, start Dante more. Um, yeah. And then the other thing too is, as, as you mentioned, um, perhaps they're they're gonna you know run the ball with Steele and Harden a lot, you know, to, to just kind of shorten the game a little bit, um, which kind of limits the opportunities for Garbers and. Haynes just Haynes King just feels like the safer pick. Yeah, that, that was the deciding factor for me. It's like King's been there all season. He's the starter. There's no question. And they don't have a head coach who does a bunch of weird stuff all the time. So it's just a little bit more of a known commodity there. Whereas UCLA, it's it's you know, I don't know, Chip Chip could, yeah, as as we just mentioned, he might at halftime make a switch. You never really know. So absolutely. All right, our next quarterback question comes from Awood Sports on Twitter, and it's quarterback Shevin Cordero of San Jose State versus his old team, Hawaii, or Frank Harris of UTSA versus East Carolina. You want to start us off, Justin? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, both of these options are not great. I assume this person is dealing with a lot of buys or they're in a deep league or something like that, and, and these are the, these are the, the options at their disposal. It's that time of year, right? So – um and actually both of these guys are sort of share that similarity in that they're both pretty disappointing this season uh, more so harris than cordero i guess but uh cordero also has been pretty disappointing uh yeah i don't know neither of them sort of stand out to me as like a guy i would love to start like i, I wouldn't really be happy starting well I, I shouldn't say that that's a bit extreme but i mean both of them sort of have been fledgling all season I do like that Cordero is playing his old team. I, would, you know, that's one of those non-quantifiable things where I always feel like, oh, that's usually good, at least from motivation standpoint. Uh, you, you assume, you know, uh, he's, he's going to be up for that game. 
uh, in terms of like Frank Harris, again, you know, he had one good game so far this season. I know he's been dealing sort of with injuries as well. I think he's probably back to full go by now, but he's still not really producing at a, at a high level. So both options are not great, but you have to make a decision, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like both matchups are favorable, though. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, Hawaii, you know, they're going to throw the ball around. East Carolina is, I don't know what the right word, they, they're they are not good. Um not good on offense, not good on defense. So, you know, a fairly uh, easy, uh, you know, a good matchup for both team, both of these quarterbacks. So I don't think there's a wrong answer. Um, yeah. It just kind of be kind of, I don't know, like gut feeling, I guess. Uh, that's kind of the way I felt about it when I was, you know, trying to decide who to pick. Yeah, that was the same way. All right. So when we both went different directions here, um, I just I, I liked the matchup against East Carolina better. Um, yeah, I mean that's fair. They're, yes, just, they're just so bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's fair. I mean both 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 opponents are not great. Uh, Hawaii is also not great. So for me, actually, it was just the fact that like it's Cordero's old team. Like I was just like you, know, I was like, well, both they're, they're, they're both yeah, they're both like pretty even for me in terms of just their profile. So I was like, well, let me just go with the. You know, I, I know Cordero is going to be motivated for this one, so let me just roll with him. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if I was going to pick who I think had the – I feel like, you know, this could be a Frank Harris breakout game. And so I feel like maybe he had the higher ceiling. Um, but certainly I think Cordero probably has the better floor or safer floor maybe, better way to say it. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree more or less, yeah. So um, split decision there. Um, but the good news is I don't – at the end of the day, I don't know that there, you could look back at this and there not be a huge difference between the two. So, um, yeah, sorry sorry, we didn't help make your decision for you. Uh, hopefully they just both have really good games. And then absolutely, be- absolutely, which is – which is given the opponents is certainly yeah. in the realm of possibility as well. All right, uh, moving on to the running backs. So – this is comes from uh, Daniel Melgar on Twitter, and we had to pick two. He actually gave us four names, um, but we can't put four names on the graphics, so I shortened it down to three. Um, but he gave us Jawar Jordan of Louisville going against Duke, Devin Neal of Kansas going against Oklahoma, and Dylan Johnson of Washington going against Stanford. And I, I did not include Le'Veon Moss of Texas A&M. I don't remember off the top of my head who they are playing. South Carolina, Carolina, there you go. So, um, for me, there was one, like, easy guy to pick. Um, I mean, I feel like all, you know, Duke's defense is solid. You know, they have, they have, they have a, they have a really solid defense. They're not, you know, they don't have any studs per se, but as a unit, they, they are a pretty solid defensive unit. Oklahoma, the same. Um, they got some, you know, great stud linebackers, the Stutzman and Kanak. Um, they are a pretty solid defense. And then you have Stanford, right? And they're not, <laughs> they're not any of the above, <laughs> you know, their, their defense is not, is not so great. So clearly that's from a matchup standpoint, that's probably the best matchup of the running backs. Um, so yeah. Any yeah. Yeah, I appreciate your insight on this. Obviously, as you're like an IDP guy, you kind of know, you know, the granular level, like the defenses, like if they have some good players, who's good or not. So that definitely helps, right, when you're assessing the matchups. Yeah. Uh, my thoughts sort of mirror yours, and I'm glad you mentioned that Moss was also included as we were, we were talking about this pre-show. So I'll have something to say about this in the next slide, I suppose. Uh, but, you know, these three options that are here on the screen, I think they're, you know, they're solid options. Actually, to me, none of them stand out uh, as a must start. Um, Jordan is dealing with something in, in terms of health, so we're not even sure that he's going to play this weekend. That kind of made it a little more even, I would say, in terms of selecting between these guys. I would expect Dylan Johnson to have sort of a bounce back. You know, it was a weird game. Yeah, we actually mentioned this last week, and I, I was like, yeah. I asked you, is it in Arizona State? And you're like, no, no, it's, at, in, it's in Washington. And I was like, okay, that's good, because weird stuff happens <laughs> in AZ State. <laughs> yeah. uh, it turns out I think it's just like games that are involving the Sun Devils. Weird things just happen. 
um, because that was a weird game last year. It was a weird game. It was, I guess, just a letdown game right after the Oregon win for them. Yeah, I think so. I just don't think they were up for it. And then Dylan Johnson had a shocking stat line. It was very strange, uh, just overall sort of game plan and, and sort of how the game went. So I, I would assume that this would be a game where Dylan Johnson will get back on track. Definitely a good matchup, as you said. Um, and then, yeah, Devin Neal, we, we sort of already touched on him in the previous segment, I think. So. All right. So we both picked Dylan Johnson. Um, again, the easiest matchup. Um, I went with Neil. Uh, you went with Jordan. Um, so the primary reason why I boarded Jordan was, as you said, uh, the injury issue. Um, and it's, he's, he's questionable to play. And then throw that on top of Duke, which is a pretty solid defensive unit. Um, just kind of led me led me to Neil. Uh, I just feel, like I said earlier, I feel like if, if Kansas is going to stay in that game, they, they've got to feed him the ball. He's, he's their best playmaker. Um, you know, I, I could see a game was maybe like two years ago when Devin Neal was a freshman. I remember how he had that awesome game against yeah. Texas. Like yes. that's kind of, that's kind of what I'm visioning for this game against, um, against Oklahoma. <laughs> well, that's going to be, yeah, like the best case scenario. I would say like in terms of the range of outcomes, yeah, 250 something yards, four touchdowns, I think is probably the best case scenario. Uh, yeah, that's fair in terms of what you were saying. And as you mentioned, and as I sort of alluded to earlier, so Moss, Le'Veon Moss was like the fourth option uh, on this question. And so originally, like, for those who don't know, like uh, with, with Justice, he has to make the graphics ahead of time for these shows. And so he needs me to make the selection quite early. Uh, and usually, you know, I just give him a name off the top of my head. I don't, you know, because I'm <laughs> kind of busy also. So after thinking about it a little bit and looking at the fact that yeah Jordan is uh, dealing sort of you know something off the field health wise, not really even sure he's going to play. And generally when that's the case, I try to just discard that player from my sort of process. Uh, and I was actually sort of taking another look. And Le'Veon Moss, you know they've had sort of tough opponents the last couple of games, um, Tennessee and Alabama, I believe, for the last two games, and they were on a bye. But he sees pretty steady carry volume, and they're playing South Carolina this weekend, which you know, they should be able to run the ball well on them um, in terms of just their strength of defense. There's nothing that stands out that scares me. And just as you can probably, you know, talk more if there's you know, individual players on that. Yeah, team. I mean, when, when, when your leading tacklers are your three safeties, that's not usually a good sign for defense. Wow, that's, that's a great sign for the running backs because it means, yeah, I mean, the guys are breaking through first, second level, uh, and that's all you really ask for is one-on-one -on -one chances with the safety DBs. Good things tend to happen. So, yeah, after thinking about it more, this is what I would say. Yeah, Johnson, I, I would play. I think he's going to have a bounce back game. And then I, I would actually go with Moss. Um, if Jordan, if this health thing sort of, if there's no clarity on it, like there's not a definitive statement, he's good, he's 100%. I'd probably just roll with Moss. Uh, I really don't like playing this guessing game, like, well, he's probable, and then 10 minutes before his game, you got right. another one. That, that's just who has time for that, right? And it's just an extra level of anxiety I don't want to deal with. So. Hey. It didn't comes we out. have like wasn't like a week or two ago? What wasn't it with Jordan where there was like like they said he was good to go and then they only gave him two carries or something? Am I, I don't remember right? that, but I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I, like, I just haven't really followed him. I thought that I thought it was him, but I could be mistaken. Uh, you, you might be right. Yeah, no, it, it might just be something I missed. But Jordan, you know, obviously he's a great player, and when he gets the touches, he's extremely efficient. But the, the question is sort of like, you know, is he even if he plays, like, is he good? Really? Right. Like, is he percent it's not the same absolutely all right on to our next running back question and this comes from justin nottingham on twitter it's trey benson of florida state against wake forest um the two-way player sony vaki from utah going against oregon or darius taylor of minnesota going against michigan state you want to lead us off justin yeah this one this one wasn't too bad for me because it was only pick one, right? If it was pick two, yep, I, think I, would have had, pick one. I would have had a tougher time with this. Although I, this is another one I might have to double check because I know Darius Taylor is dealing also with like some injuries, right? Like he's been banged up. Well, he was banged week. up, and then um, I didn't watch the game against Iowa, but I heard like like he didn't play like the last three or four drives. Um, okay, that's so, interesting. And so that yeah, 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 uh, yeah. 
and we, I haven't heard anything. I haven't seen anything, but and I didn't watch the game, but someone was telling me that he didn't play like the last couple drives. So mm-hmm. don't know if they were just saving him or he got hurt. He re-injured whatever the injury was before or what's going on with him. Okay. Well, I'm going to spoil it for the, for the viewer. Like I, I chose Taylor, I believe, and but I'm going to have to invoke a similar sort of uh, reasoning of what I used in the last segment, which is, if he's if you know if he is indeed sort of there's no clarity on like his health or not, not a definitive statement that like he's good to go 100 uh, percent then I'd probably go elsewhere. Uh, it's going to show on the graphic that I chose Taylor, but I'll, I'll discuss maybe who I'd go with. When we I get mean, there. from a from a pure matchup standpoint, right? Um, Trey Benson probably has the best matchup of the three. I yeah, would say. Um, I'm going to spoil it. Benson would be probably the guy I would actually select. Then, given I mean, the Michigan Taylor's State. Role. Hasn't been great, but they've been decent against the run. Um, so, and then Oregon, Oregon's a pretty solid defense too. Um, yeah. So, there you go. Um, I chose Vaki. I just feel like he's like. What worries me about Benson is he's either gonna he's either gonna go for like twenty points or like five. I know. And I, and I just hate. I, I don't like that inconsistency. <laughs> Um, yeah. this does, this does feel like a game that it could be him going for 20. Right. Yeah. Um, but I just feel like, you know, the last two weeks, Utah has made it a point to get Vaki the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we saw him carrying it last week. We saw him, you know, catching, catching the ball. Um, I don't, I don't expect that to, to change. Um, and the, you know, they're going to have to continue to do those things in order to have any kind of shot at beating Oregon. Yeah, there's no doubt. And that's kind of what concerns me actually about Flocky is just like this Utah, because they're so banged up. Like, are they going to be able to hang with Oregon in this game? Like they're, they're walking wounded, basically. Oregon is a very good team. You know, they just barely lost to Washington. They're still a top 10 team. They're, they are a very good defense. So while we know that it's like basically Jaquindon Jackson and Flocky are like the offense now, um, I am just sort of worried about like game script and like how this game will go and if they'll be able to generate much offensive production. Uh, but he did kind of sell me there. In, in terms of Benson, you know, yeah, his, his woes are well documented at this point. Uh, obviously, he's been disappointing this year, but he's had the odd game where he's done well. He's just not a guy who consistently gets volume. And that's kind of been Mike Norvell's MO since he got to Florida State, which is kind of strange because, you know, when you look at this right. time, <laughs> this, he basically had bell cow after bell cow after bell cow. Some reason he gets to Tallahassee, he decides no, we're gonna just switch it up completely. And every single season he's been there, it's been a committee. So they've they've never had a guy while Norvell's been at Florida State, he's just been 250 plus carry guy. They just don't seem to do that. So with Trey Benson, yeah, you know, it's um you're on a knife's edge, really. I mean, it's quite a bit of risk. The range of outcomes are quite high or quite, I guess, lengthy. I guess would be the way to put it. You know, he could go for over 200 yards, 20 carries, a couple touchdowns, or, you know, he's continuing the split carries with Boafili, split carries with Travis even, and he ends up going for less than five or six points, right? So, yeah, if Taylor's, I guess he is injured, it kind of muddies the waters here on, on this op, on this selection. It's not really one great option. Each one has, has no, a pretty he, there's, there's, bad. There's flaws with each one, right? Yeah, so but you know, I'm gonna roll. Even though the, the graphics is Taylor, I'm gonna roll Benson uh, as a revised sort of answer. Uh, but you know, I don't feel that strongly about it. So you know, if you like that, you I will say that. you know Utah is probably the well. I would they are they're the, they're the best defense that Oregon's faced. Um, mm-hmm. They did lose uh, one of their linebackers for the season in the in the game last week against USC. Um, but uh, linebacker, they're pretty deep at, so I, I don't expect them that, that to hurt them too much. Um, but it will be interesting to see, um, you know, Vaki continue to play two ways. If that's if he, you know, if he yeah. if he's able to do that, if he keep doing that at the level he's doing it, you know, because he's he's still starting, you know, one of their starting safeties, um, and then playing all the snaps on offense too. Yeah, you figure he's going to break down at some point, but you know we're only three games into the dual usage, so maybe he's still fresh at that point. And and this game could certainly be a lot higher, you know, a lot you know a lot faster paced uh, than some of the, than, than the last two for sure. Yeah, definitely. 
All right, uh, moving on to our wide receiver questions. This first one comes from Shady Sports on Twitter. We got Emeka Ibuka of Ohio State against Wisconsin, Evan Stewart of Texas A&M against South Carolina, and Brennan Presley of Oklahoma State against Cincinnati. Um, This one wasn't too difficult, I felt like. Um, You know, Egbuka, you got the injury issue, right? Um, We don't know if he's going to play or not. And even even before that, it wasn't like he was stellar in terms of, you know, production for fantasy purposes. Uh, Brennan Presley has been, um, the last few weeks especially, has been pretty – pretty consistent with, you know, getting good, good target volume. He is the slot receiver. So his you know, his yards are going to be a little, you know, less than what you expect given his targets and and receptions. But um, you you can't argue with the volume that he's getting, you know, on a, on a weekly basis here. Um, From a defensive standpoint, I feel like all three of these teams are kind of similar. They're not, they're not like terrible. They're just kind of average defenses, I guess. So, I don't know that anyone has to, has a matchup edge from that standpoint. Um, anything you want to add, Justin? No, I mean, I think you covered it pretty well. I, I agree with most of what you said there. I think, you know, in terms of matchups, nothing really stands out. Uh, Oklahoma State, you know, they've, they've figured something out there in terms of, like, the run game. Uh, Ollie Gordon's just absolutely torching it. Uh, he scores sort of long touchdowns too, so that's sort of one thing to keep in mind for any of the other offensive players there. It's like it's, it's he basically the last couple of weeks has, has been taking all the production, all, all the yards, all the touchdowns. But but Presley's been pretty good too, as you said. Like he, he last two weeks, double digit targets, uh, and he's been solid. So uh, you like the floor with him, Ekbuka. I feel like a lot of the questions we've gotten this week's segment, you know, at least one of the players has like a, a, a injury issue. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, again, if I'm giving the answer away, but generally, you know, I try to stay away from those players if possible. Uh, and then, uh, you know, Stuart, everybody knows about Stuart. I won't talk too much about him. All right. Uh, we both agree. We both went with Stuart. Um, you want to explain your reason? Yeah, well, you know, I, I mentioned Moss earlier against South Carolina. And, you know, I, I don't know that much about South Carolina's defense, but I know there's not enough to say like, okay, I should be worried if I had to start a player against them. I think they're middle of the road. And as you mentioned to me, you know, safety seem to be leading tacklers. So actually they're probably not a very good defense. Uh, Stewart, you know, he's the five-star super, super recruit there and a true sophomore. Um, when he's playing and he's healthy, there's definitely a, a concerted effort to get on the ball. Uh, he's been pretty good this season, maybe a little up and down, but, you know, this feels like a game where you should be able to to be quite productive. Obviously, they had a quarterback change midseason, but you know he's he's been good through it all. So I'm not really I just don't have any concerns or question marks about Stewart. I know his role there. I'm, I assume he's making a massive amount of NIL money coming from boosters. So there's probably a lot of pressure to just make sure he's involved, uh, even just off the field. So uh, yeah, I mean he should be a big part of the game plan as he has been all season. Presley. You know, we were mentioning it really came down to Stewart and Presley for me because yeah. obviously he's kind of dealing with an injury. And Presley, yeah, as we were just mentioning, you know, his role has ascended. He's he's, he's a lot of targets. He's he's you know he's pretty involved in that offense also. Uh, but I don't know, Stewart just has been more consistent all season. Um, and you know, I like his matchup. So he had to pick one. That was the one I went with. Yeah, I feel like Stewart has the higher ceiling, um, and I don't know that his floor is that drastically different than Presley's. Yeah. Um, I just think Presley's role in that offense kind of limits his ceiling, right? He's he's not an outside guy. He, he is he's the he's the slot guy. So he's going to get the volume. He's just not necessarily going to get the yards and and perhaps not the touchdowns. Um, so yeah, I just Stewart, you know, could have a, a monster game um, for yeah. Texas A and M. And so yeah, higher ceiling, and that's that's kind of why I chose Stewart. Yeah, no doubt. All right, our next wide receiver question. This comes from Ty Myers on Twitter. We got Elijah Badger, and this was um, pick two, I believe. Yes. Um, Elijah Badger of Arizona State going against Washington State. Silas Bolden of Oregon State going against Arizona. And ah, I messed up this graphic. (laughs) Alec Oyamaner for Stanford, and they are going against Washington. 
you want to lead us off here? Sure. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I don't see what part of the graphic was messed up. I, I didn't. I didn't. I, the opponent. I put Stanford as the opponent instead of Washington. Oh, yeah, the logo. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was looking. I was like, am I just missing the obvious? I guess it was. <laughs> um, yeah, so pick two of the three, as you mentioned, was the question. So that always makes it a little bit more interesting. Uh, three good options. None of them are, are immediately standing out to me as like head and shoulders above the rest. But uh, I don't. I wouldn't be unhappy if I had to start any three of these players. So Badger uh, for Arizona State. You know he's kind of he is their wide receiver one. And despite the fact that their quarterback position has been in flux, he's been pretty good. He sees good volume targets wise, uh, and he's just been good. I would say all season he's been pretty consistent. And they're playing Washington State. Not a bad matchup, honestly. Uh, Silas Bolden, he was sort of quietly productive for a while. I think now people have sort of gravitated towards him. He's not, you know, it's not a game breaker um, in terms of like his upside, but he's pretty consistent in terms of, you know, his usage and his production also. Uh, and then in terms of uh, Ayo Manor, or Ayo Manor, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing properly, uh, but Stanford's wide receiver. Uh, he is kind of like a really high upside player. Like he is the definition, basically, of a game-breaking <laughs> wide receiver. Where we just saw it two weeks ago, you know, he could go for twenty. It went nuclear. <laughs> wow, exactly. So, uh, you know, and last week, you know, I was skeptical after that first performance, just because we hadn't really yep. seen much like that up until that point. Uh, but he was still pretty involved last week. I believe he saw thirteen targets. Yeah, I think he had 13 to eight catches on 13, eight or nine catches on 13 targets. So, yeah. Which is good, right? Like, he's not going to go for 250 yards every week, but if he's still seeing 13, you know, double digit targets, uh, that's good. He will be a good player. And so, uh, if that continues in, in this game, they should be trailing most of the game, which is kind of, yeah, the, the concern a little bit is will they be able to even run their offense well enough to have a player do well? Uh, but in terms of game script, you know, we at least should know that they're probably going to be trailing so they yeah, should be able, yeah. yeah they should be sort of prompted to pass the ball early and often so interesting question don't want to give away the answer uh hopefully thoughts provide some insight there yeah i mean from a defensive standpoint i mean i don't know that any of these it, 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 stanford's probably the worst but it's not like arizona and washington state are great defenses either um they're they're okay uh but and I, I do think from a game script standpoint, like there's going to be a lot of passing in all these games. The only game script that could concern me slightly is Oregon State wants to slow down the Arizona offense. And so they, they go heavy run, right, to try to keep the Arizona offense off the field. Um, I could see them doing that. Um, but obviously the Arizona offense is, you know, explosive. And it certainly could also be a situation where Oregon State's going to have to have to throw it more than maybe they want to just to keep pace with Arizona, right? So, yeah. Well, and I think the graphic tripped you up there again because Stanford's playing Washington, right? So Stanford's, you know, we know. It's oh, that's right. Duh. Yeah. Yes. But Washington's <laughs> yes, that is the good. Yeah, yeah they are good defense. <laughs> if they are playing, you know, Stanford's defense, yeah, this would be great. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Mess my, my own graphic messed me up. But, yes, Washington is a good defense. And, like I said, uh, your, your concern about Stanford just being able to operate anything against the, against uh, Washington, you know, is, is a valid concern as well. All right, uh, let's go on to our selections. So we both agreed with Elijah Badger, and then we had a split decision on the second two. Uh, you went with Bolden. I went with Alec Ayamaner. Um, main reason I went with him is just upside. Yeah, I figured. Yeah, for, for me, I, I sort of went with the safer pick. You know, generally when we do these, I feel like uh, if, if there's a pick two of the three, I try to go one who's safe, one who's upside. Uh, broke tendency on this one, just went with sort of the two guys who have been consistent, or at least more consistent all season. Yeah. I kind of know a little bit more about them in terms of what their role is. Uh, A.O. Maynard, obviously, he's been on a tear two weeks in a row, and two, you know, two weeks in a row, double-digit targets. So we'll see if that continues. Uh, but as I mentioned it in the last segment, too, yeah, I am concerned just in general about how effective Stanford will be in this game. They can do anything, and, and will it be a case where they're so out of it by third quarter that they're just like, well, what, you know, let's just take the main guys out, or you know, why are we even sort of 
forcing it to AO Mainer anymore. Let's just shut it down, run it, you know, try to finish this game as soon as possible. <laughs> right, so try I, to get it over with, shorten the game. Yeah, but that, that's probably me just overanalyzing this. Uh, you know, but I think in terms of like it's something tangible really to hold on to is just the first two were a little bit more consistent all season. Yep. They've been seeing more consistent volume all season. Uh, so those were the two, uh, Badger and Bolden, that I decided to pick. All right, uh, let's move on to our flex questions. And our first flex question uh, comes from Brandon Champion on Twitter. And it's running back Kajan Owens, a Florida International, going against Jacksonville State. Uh, running back Anthony Grant going against Purdue. And I messed this one up, too, in terms of Daniel Jackson is not a running back. He's a receiver. Uh, but Daniel Jackson, uh, wide receiver for Minnesota, going up against um, Michigan State. We had to pick one, and this was a, uh, a PPR um, format. Um you know, Owens shares time there at Florida National with Shamari Lawrence. Um, he's kind of been the hot hand lately, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Grant, um, I know we talked about him last week. We both kind of expected him to have to have a big game, and and it wasn't. Was it uh, freshman Emmett Johnson? I got that right? Is that that? Yeah, kind of was somebody new. Uh, I can't remember the name, but yeah, it was somebody. Yeah, he kind of went off, and Anthony Grant didn't do too much, and um, Daniel Jackson's. You know he's 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 had his ups and downs, but he's been somewhat um, steady. I feel like for for Minnesota, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm in agreement. So with Grant, I think like his thing is he has fumbling problems, and so like he's always one fumble away. Basically, I don't know if he fumbled in that that game, but I do know like he's just kind of I guess on rocky terms there. But you know, last week when we answered this question, and Grant was part of one of those questions, you know, he's basically, we're thinking, well, he's the last guy they have left and they have a good matchup. Well, yeah. They played just, Northwestern. Didn't, didn't pan out that way, but it's hard to predict that in advance. Uh, but now, you know, we've seen last weekend, we know that they've got another guy who they feel good about, probably maybe even better than Grant at this point. I'm um, just in terms of coach's confidence. So Grant is, is one where he's, he's on the slippery slope, but I wouldn't want to start him this week, even though the matchup is okay in itself. Uh, Owens, you know, agree with everything you said that I didn't, you know, I didn't really consider him too much in this question. Uh, and then Daniel Jackson, the wide receiver. Yeah, he's been pretty good, save for like two weeks uh, of the season so far. I think week two, week three, he was kind of uh, were sort of his low points. But outside of that, he's been pretty good. He's been pretty consistent. Uh, he saw 13 targets last game. So I don't expect him to be consistently seeing double digit targets, but, you know, he's he's solid. And you, you never know when those games are going to come. Michigan State, they should be able to move the ball in Michigan State. Yeah, um, and, and and the fact if you know Darius Taylor's out, uh, we know Zach Evans is hurt. So you know, I don't know what you know. They I guess they turn back to Sean Tyler. I don't know if he's healthy. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, I think we kind of both answered the answered it when we were talking through it. But uh, for me, it was if it was non PPR, it was a lot closer. But given the fact that it was PPR. Daniel Jackson to me was the easy choice. Yeah, for me it was an easy choice just because uh, not that high on Owens and Grant. As I said, there's a significant sort of uh, red flag there now, so it was kind of like, well, <laughs> last man standing. Jackson, there isn't really that much in terms of like flags of his profile. He's he's safe. Right. Uh, I, I, he, he's the one I'd feel the best about starting. Absolutely. All right, uh, our next flex question. And once again, I forgot to change the uh, the wide receivers or running back to a wide receiver. But oh, uh, <laughs> um, just comes from John Ludovant uh, on Twitter. It's a flex uh, start one. It's no PPR and a bonus for long touchdowns. So we got running back Marcus Carroll going against uh, for, of Georgia State going against Georgia Southern. Running back DJ Giddens of Kansas State going against Houston, and then a wide receiver. Tory Horton of Colorado State going against Air Force. You want to start us off, Justin? Sure. Uh, good question. This was pick one, if I remember correctly, right? Yes, pick one. Yeah. So um, I'll just say right off the bat, like Giddens, um, assuming I haven't missed some major piece of news on Trayshawn Ward, yeah, I, I'm not really sure what he's 
doing in, in terms of this question. Uh, there's two guys who make it interesting. Giddens for me is clearly three. Uh, <laughs> we're choosing, you know, to start one of these guys this week. I mean, yeah, the matchup's good, but we know he sort of start, splits carries there with Trayshawn Ward. The other two are, are, you know, arguably the best at their position. I mean, Carroll's in the RB1 conversation. Obviously, Genty has been absurd this season, but Carroll's right there. He's, he's in the top five, at least. Ford in the same deal at wide receiver. He's, he's ridiculously productive. So for me, or again, if we're picking one of the three, it really came down to Carroll and Horton, just based on the fact these are these are studs in CFF. We need a top five players at their position. Giddens is nowhere. It's not that, right? Um, right? Could have a massive game. You never know. But in terms of what we can predict ahead of time, we know Carroll's the bell cow at Georgia Southern or Georgia State, I should say. Uh, we know Horton's wide receiver one, and that's a that's a historically really productive offense. So, um, yeah. And then in terms of matchups, you know, Giddens does have a good matchup. I would, I, I'm not really worried about Carroll's matchup against Georgia Southern, regardless of what maybe the analytics or, or numbers say. I, I believe he's probably going to have a pretty productive game this weekend. Um, Tory Horton versus Air Force service academies are always strange. You don't, you never know what what might happen. I mean, that that's because they run a different style offense. The game could be condensed, so it's hard to say in terms of you know what exactly will happen. But again, he's top five player in this position, at least top ten in that discussion. So. Yeah, you kind of know what you're going to get with them. Yeah, on the matchup discussion, I mean, like, if I would add anything, I would say Air Force probably is the toughest matchup. They're the better defense um, yeah. of the three. And then, you know, obviously Air Force's game is run, 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 and run some more. So, you know, that that, that limits the opportunities for the other team's offense, assuming Air Force can run the ball effective. And I would assume against Colorado State they shouldn't have too much trouble too much trouble with that so um yeah we we agreed we both went with marcus carroll uh for me the fact that it was no ppr made it a slam dunk like if it was p it, it had to be ppr for me to um uh, for me to make it close with tory horton yeah I, I didn't want to mention that too much in the, in the pre-slide he's like oh that'll probably give it away but right. yeah I mean, in general as i mentioned last week when it comes to flex spots regardless even of the uh the scoring uh, measurement. I usually like the running backs just because, you know, if, if, if you have a running back on your team, presumably they're the bell cow of their team and the guy who's going to see the ball 20 times versus the guy who you know, might get 10 targets that game, just you can weigh, weigh that calculation. Um, and in general, like I'm not a guy who's, you know, says that you always have to start certain players because of their pedigree, like just because these guys are top five at their position, you have to start them every week. But the matchups that they have are not so bad or bad enough to, to dissuade me from starting them. Obviously, you know, Tory Horton against Air Force, yeah, that's not a fantastic matchup. But it's not bad enough for me to be like, well, not don't start him this right. game. If you had to start him, I would. You know, I, I, to be honest, I, I don't know who else this this person has on their team. I would try to find a way to get Horton uh, on the on, on the lineup. Uh, but Carroll, there's really no strikes against him in terms of like if if I was just assessing his profile. Nothing wrong with the matchup. Uh, in the terms of the player and the pedigree and, and his role in all, that offense, it means everything you want, right? So there, there's there's really no no animosity there. And then yeah, as you mentioned, no PPR. That's just that's the final nail in the coffin, I think. Yeah, for me, when when, there, when it's not a PPR league, I always will lean towards a running back just because they're just going to be more consistent. Um, yes. When you get the half PPR and the one PPR, then yeah, then, then it make, makes more. Especially when it's a full PPR, I probably swing the other way, and I I'm, I I tend to go more towards the uh, towards the receivers. So, but yeah, Marcus Carroll, great matchup. You know, he he's a he's a stud, um, and you know, I, I the, the long the bonus long touchdown didn't really. I don't really see that coming into play with any of these guys. Um, so for me, just more the sheer volume and, uh, you know, that, that I think Carroll will get and has gotten all year. Yeah, some, some of these, like, scoring formats, they're sort of unique, like the, the bonus long. I, I, I didn't even really consider that in the analysis just because it's hard to predict that. Yeah, Obviously, absolutely. as a wide receiver, he has that explosive option and probably, you know, if someone scores a long touchdown, it'd be more likely to be a wide receiver. But it's hard to predict that. I wouldn't really want to lean on that too much in terms of choosing who to start. 100%. To me, you you, you got to go with what where the, you know, what's consistent, right? Carries, receptions are consistent. Uh, yards, you know, generally can be somewhat consistent. But, uh, you know, a 90-yard touchdown, you can't 
you can't predict that, right? No. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to our tight end questions. Our first tight end question comes from Lefty Tarkanian on Twitter. And it's Trey Knox of South Carolina going against Texas A&M. Arliss Borningham of Florida going against Georgia. And Jake Brenningstool of Clemson going against NC State. This, you know, I, I envy his choices here. Um, I, I was talking to Justin earlier. I'm, I'm in a two touchdown, a two tight end league, and both of my tight ends are on bye, and then my, you know, my two reserves are injured. So I'm kind of in a, in, a, in a bit of a pickle. Um, I wish I wish I had at least one of these guys, if not two, right? And, and, and here we are getting to pick uh, one from three. Um, I. I don't know that there's a wrong answer to this question um, when you're talking about tight ends, right? You're, you're yeah. just kind of playing a guessing game in terms of who's going to get a touchdown. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, they've all they've all done really well the last several weeks. Yeah, I mean, Trey Knox, you know, I'd say he's probably been the more consistent of the three season long. So that's one thing uh, you can try to latch on to. Uh, but then also, I guess you're kind of looking at the matchups. You know, tight end, it's so finicky, as you mentioned. It, it'll come down to who probably scores a touchdown, you know, assuming one of the three, at least one of the three does. Brennan still obviously yep. had that massive game last weekend. One of my opponents, uh, the only reason I, I remember that is one of my opponents in, in one of the leagues I play in had Brennan still, and it just seemed like he scored all the touchdowns for Clemson just randomly. Like, uh, yep. no Shipley, no Club Nick, you know, all these guys, it was just Brennan still was just scoring. And it was like, come on. But uh, yeah, and Boardingham, you know, he's the young kid. At Florida, uh, for those who don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm a Dogs fan, so I guess by just by that, I have to I have to hate Fordingham. Uh, I think that's how the rules work. But uh, <laughs> he's been good. He's been good in like the last yes. two weeks. I remember. And then I guess they were on. Yeah, they they would have been on by last week before this game. So, uh, yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, all, all three. I mean, in terms of, as tight ends go, yeah, all three are fine options. You wouldn't be upset about having to start one of them any of them really so i mean from a pure matchup standpoint nc state's the worst defense but they're not like terrible um obviously georgia's a stout defense texas a is a pretty stout defense so um yeah i think it just kind of comes down to what what your preference is and what you look for exactly so let's get to our selections um i went with brenningstool uh just because i felt like he's you know, I think he's had 10 targets and six targets the last two weeks uh, and just kind of took the hot hand approach, right? Um, mm -hmm. He was someone I was high on before the season. Um, so I, I already had – I was already, you know, I already liked the guy. Um, and, you know, he's kind of been the hot hand lately. Boardingham, um, the Georgia defense, man. I just don't know how Graham Mertz is going to uh, perform. And so that kind of that kind of you know shied me away from him. Um, Knox is certainly, like you said, a safe choice, consistent choice. I just don't know. I don't know that you know. I feel like Brinning still has a better chance of getting a touchdown. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, uh, I was I was just looking at Knox in preparation of this question, and he's had like eight targets three of his last five games. And as I mentioned earlier, it just seems he's been more consistent throughout the season versus the other two. So it kind of just came down to that for me. But, and, and to be honest, like his upside, I mean, it feels like he could, like he had some big games, I believe, when he was at Arkansas before he transferred. Yes. Yep. He has a good skill set. At tight end, it's hard, you know, they, I guess technically they all have high upside. If they just happen to score two touchdowns that game, then probably he's one of the top scoring tight ends that week, right? So that happened to Brennan still last week. You know, I think the, the odds of that happening twice, you know, it's probably not that high, but hey, I mean, it could happen. You see strange things happen all the time. So, yeah, I mean, you had to pick one. Uh, for me, it was just about the consistency of Knox. All right, and we'll move on to our last question of the evening. Uh, another tight end question. This comes from Dan Miller on Twitter, and it's Theo Johnson of Penn State against Indiana or Corey Deitches of Maryland against Northwestern. Um, you know, on the surface, the this is this looks like a pretty, you know, again, who's going to score the touchdown kind of question, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which, unless you have Dallin Holker, like, 
Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the game you're playing with tight ends. I feel like you know, especially with Bowers out. Um, yeah, pretty much. There's basically yeah that that position's just been decimated. There's really no one left as as you mentioned, basically Holker, maybe Mitchell Evans and a couple of guys there. But um, I thought I saw something that Dichess was dealing with an injury also. Although I believe yeah, he I think is he's questionable. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, you know, that kind of makes this question a little easier. Obviously, you want to monitor the health of Dijes. Dijes just hasn't – he's been a disappointment. He's, he's a tight end I know that a lot of people drafted in CFF this year. Not high or anything, but, like, you know, he was a drafted tight end. People were hoping he might be okay for CFF-wise. And for the most part, I believe he's been a disappointment. So, you know, jo Theo Johnson, he shares targets with another tight end. Tyler uh, Warren. There we go, yeah. Uh, number 44, Tyler Warren. So there is that, but, you know, he's had some big games. And when it comes to tight end position, in the absence of one guy who's been consistently solid, you know, I'd probably default to just, okay, well, who has the higher upside and just take a swing. Uh, and especially, you know, if one is dealing with health issues, that generally makes the question, the answer a little easier, I would say. Yeah. So we both agreed. We both went with Theo Johnson. Um, I will say that even – Let's if, even if I was to assume that Dykes was healthy and going to play, I yeah. still would, I still would go with Theo Johnson. Um, you know, again, kind of taking the hot hand approach. He, he's he's you know had the hot hand the last two weeks, um, and so hopefully that can continue against the Indiana uh, Indiana defense that's not so great. And Penn State bounces back after that uh, loss against Ohio State. Yeah, no, it's good you mentioned the matchup. I mean, yeah, they, they actually both have good matchups. And I think I'm on the same page with you, I think if Digest – it's actually funny, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Justice sends me the questions. I make the selections like Monday. When I originally chose this, I think I just chose Digest, but I didn't really think about it. And then, uh, you know, I was looking at the, the health concerns, but then I just also took another look at, like, what Digest has done this season. And he's, he's been worse than even I, like, was thinking he was doing. Uh, so in terms of just like even if that just was playing as Justice said, I think I also would choose Theo Johnson, who at the very least like he's shown in his range of outcomes he can get 20 points or like a decent like a, a good performance, and so picking him you just you know you take a chance it, it might not probably won't you know really yield a massive uh, production a massive day for him but you know just the fact that there's a chance that he might have a, a good game whereas Dijes uh, I don't know if he's had one single good game yet this season. I'd have to double check, but certainly in the last like three or four games. Yet, right? Maybe like one early in the year, but it feels like that's yeah. it. Yeah. I just, yeah, I don't like the prospects for him this week of doing so. If he's already sort of dealing with a health concern and he hasn't really done it recently, it just made the decision a little easier. All right. So that's going to do it for our week nine start sit questions. Um, we look forward uh jared will be back next week to uh to help you guys along with uh along with justin for uh week um 10 which is you know it's hard to believe the final week of the regular season for college fantasy right like um yeah depending on like your playoff format for a lot of leagues week 11 i think would be it's like if you have four but yeah some leagues if you're doing six teams or whatever it's probably, yeah next week it is crazy. It goes by so fast. Like it's, it's unbelievable yeah. that we're already at that point. And I'm pretty sure at least all I think all the leagues I'm in, that is that's the end of the regular season. So uh mm -hmm. hopefully your hopefully your teams are doing well. You're gonna make the playoffs and the season will continue for all of us. Definitely. Um again, like right uh five star reviews, um, your likes, uh subscribe uh on YouTube, uh, on follow us on Twitter. Um, you can find the show at Chasing the Natty. You can find Jared at CFF underscore Jared. You can find me at uh, Justice underscore 2318. You can find Justin at Volume Pigs. Um, happy, you know, if you have questions, submit them. We'll, 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 the questions that we did not get selected for the show, um, we'll be going back or Jared will be going back to and answering them. Um, we already did answer some of the questions because they had uh, players that are actually playing uh, right now in one of the two games that's going on right now. So we tried to answer those ahead of time for you guys. Um, as always, thanks for your support and see you next week.